Two weeks ago, I made a poll on my Instagram, The Ipernik, and on my community section on YouTube, where I asked you what topic I should be talking about today. It was a close call, but the Nuncio won at the end of the day. As I already said a few times, I will be talking about the other three topics in the near future. Ever since I began talking about Italian history, the Nuncio taking Fiume has been one of the more requested topics, together with the Propaganda Due and Illyrian history. The former is a very heavy topic and I will need a lot of time to make it, while the other one, seriously? Without further ado, let's dive into the history of Gabriele D'Annunzio, one of the most eccentric people to live in Italy. D'Annunzio was born in 1863 in Pescara, Abruzzo. From a very young age, he showed passion and talent in the fields of poetry and literature, publishing his first works at the age of 16. Reached adulthood, D'Annunzio Nuncio traveled all over Italy, working as a writer and journalist in Rome, Florence and Naples. He was also in Greece and France for a time, the latter for a long period. He was praised and sought after all over Europe for his work and wherever he went he had a wide collection of lovers. Likewise, he was married several times. He started to get close to nationalism in his stay in France, where he joined the Italian Nationalist Association in 1910. There he started to apply his romantic ideals onto nationalism. He became passionate about Italian patriotism and began to see himself as the new Garibaldi. He got his chance to show it to everyone by joining the Italian army in 1915. D'Annunzio's main role on the front was to increase morale and he did so by doing propaganda for the troops and taunt the Austrians. He would fly over Austrian towns throwing flyers onto the ground on several occasions. Once he even on Vienna itself in 1918. The content of the flyers varied from insults, Italian flags and other things that overall reduced the morale of the now decaying empire. There was even one time when D'Annunzio traveled to Croatia on a motorboat with some of his accomplices, just to show that he could, angering the Austrians even more. Despite the great success of his operations and the great increase in morale he caused onto the Italian troops, the conclusion of the conflict was little more than a pyrrhic victory, because the Allies refused to give Italy most of the terre irridente they were promised. This led to a fast growth of nationalistic movements. The fascists were among the most popular, but since you are here, I'm sure you have heard of this a thousand times already. The Nunzio was certainly among the most disappointed ones. He was particularly mad about the fact that the Allies refused to give Fiume back to Italy. Fiume, also called Rijeka, was and still is a Croatian city with an Italian majority. Due to its Italian population and strategical location, it was one of the most exciting settlements that Italy was looking forward to annex. However, the Allies didn't deem it possible due to the fact that it's an Italian enclave in majority Croatian territory. Tannunzio disrespectfully disagreed and he teamed up with about a thousand soldiers. Some of these were from the Granadieri who were an elite military group from Sardinia, to travel to Fiume and to take the town back for Italy. The expedition started on September 11, 1919. One of the biggest supporters of the expedition was Benito Mussolini, who directed a newspaper at the time and happily published many updates of the event together with D'Annunzio's personal quotations. Another supporter was Giuseppe Giuliette, a unionist who provided the troops with weapons and supplies. On the 12th of September, D'Annunzio crossed the border with his little militia and just entered the city with no bloodshed. He was acclaimed by the people and then made a speech from the governor's balcony. Despite the overwhelming support by the Italians in Croatia, Nitti, who was a prime minister at the time, refused to recognize the city as part of Italy. Furthermore, he ordered Pietro Badoglio to retake Fiume as soon as possible. D'Annunzio then asked for donations to his supporters back home, but he didn't get much of them, since he was now deemed a criminal and Fiume was blockaded. On the 16th of September, D'Annunzio wrote a disappointed letter to Mussolini, scolding him for not sending any money over. Badoglio, however, didn't want to take the city by force and attempted to do negotiations with D'Annunzio. Austria-Hungary was favorable to an Italian annexation of Fiume, or at least they didn't give a shit. Also, Yugoslavia didn't seem to care for it at first, however, Nitti in 
intended to follow the terms the country had agreed to at the end of the war. For this reason, an immediate annexation, what D'Annunzio wanted, was basically impossible. Due to the uncertainty of the situation, D'Annunzio took matters on his own hands and called for Fiume's independence in December, establishing the Italian Regency of Carnaro, a model nation that, that reflected D'Annunzio's ideal form of government. In his own words, his plan was transforming the Bolshevik thistle into the rose of Italy, pink like love. Some say it makes more sense in Italian, but to be honest, I'm just as confused. From what I understood, it is an authoritarian republic where people were free and many social liberal ideas were also applied. However, you had to feel passionate love for the country, or as I like to call it, pink fascism. However, D'Annunzio had no intention to make Fiume independent permanently. He wanted it to be part of Italy, so he began plotting against uh, the now president Cholitti in order to overthrow the republic and force them to add Fiume to their territory. After writing the constitution in September 1920, the regency of Carnaro started organizing a coup d'etat against Italy. However, Cholitti will eventually find out about this and they made the Rapallo Treaty with Yugoslavia, where they essentially agreed that Fiume would be a free city. The Nuncio also refused the treaty hence forcing Italy to kick him out of there by force. At the end of December, Italy attacked Fiume, putting an end to D'Annunzio's enterprise. The city remained a free city-state for a few years until it was reacquired by Italy when Mussolini took power completely in 1924. D'Annunzio would spend the rest of his life in exile in Gardone Riviera. He lived in a big mansion by the Garda Lake. During fascist times, he was seen as a hero and was wildly popular until his death in 1938, although he had a, a very complicated relationship with Mussolini. The Nunzio's ideas are in many ways a beta form of Italian fascism. It was a mix of nationalism, Bolshevism, socialism, authoritarianism and libertarianism. Mussolini took great inspiration from the Nunzio, although I'm not entirely sure how close ideologically they were. I think that's all from me today. Thank you for watching and remember to like and subscribe to my channel if you like Italian history and want to see more. Be sure to comment down below as well and tell me what you think about D'Annunzio. Personally, I think he's a really cool guy, though I don't know if I agree with his political stances and lifestyle. One thing is for sure though, it is surely fascinating to read about him. See you next time.